Hi, my name is Andre Cohen, and I want to say thank you so much for joining us in this particular course. I, um, I was born male, and I identify as being a, a, a male, um, which gives me some privileges that I didn't ask for. It offers some hurdles, but it gives me some privileges as well. And so as we, as we look at this, I, I want you to take those things in mind that I am operating from a pr place that is balanced with privilege and with, uh, with oppressive responses to, to an oppressive system. So, so there is that balance. So there may be some things that I don't get. There may be some things that I miss. But I want to be the best advocate that I can. And hopefully through this process, you will call me an ally. One of the things that we miss oftentimes in this work is that we, we say that we're allies, but that's not something you can say. That's what other people say about you. You can be an advocate until they say you're an ally. And so in, in my presentation, I, I don't have a lot of answers. I have some questions that um, I've been trying to respond to most of my life and for the students that I served. I worked um, just on the other side of, of, of St. Paul at a charter school called Skills for Tomorrow. It was a small charter school and um, these were kids that could not or were not successful in big buildings. So they came to us for all sorts of different kinds of reasons and they had some real questions for me. And as a teacher walking into the classroom I thought I had all the answers until they started asking important questions. So the presentation I have for you are the answers to the questions that the students ask me. So I'm going to share with you what I learned from my students in this presentation. All right? So, so there's that. Um, so it's very clear that you have handouts in front of you. I have a, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, I, I am well prepared for the, for the task at hand. Um, but as important as I think my things are, and I'll get you a handout. You're very welcome. As important as I think my task is today, I, um, I'm also interested in questions that you may have or things that you were hoping we would talk about in this particular session. What did you hope we, were we would talk about in this session? In regards to what? Into uh, humanizing the human race. Okay. Okay, cool, thank you. Other folks, what did you hope we were gonna talk about? Okay, so I had to connect. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And w w how do you see that being uh, n not only something that we should talk about, but something that could be helpful in our conversation? Okay, cool. So I'll, I'll note that. Other things we were hoping we would talk about. I guess in addition to learning how to connect, I'd like to learn how to match with them. Okay. 
So to connect and not to offend. All right. Other other folks. Yes. I would say just a general accept well not acceptance, but a an appreciation and a love of differences. Okay. It doesn't have to be about there there, there can be some not connection. There can be some acceptance of how are we different and how, how let's celebrate that. All right. Maybe the value. So the valuing of, of differences. Okay. okay. Other folks, anything else? All right, cool. Is there anything that you hope that we would not talk about? If you talk about it one more time, your head will pop off. Or, uh, or you'll scream if you, if you have to talk about this thing one more time. Is there anything that you hoped that we would not talk about? then it's all on the table. Good, 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 good. So uh, the first thing I'd like for you to do is if you can uh, open up your, uh, your handout. And if you look at number three, there are five uh, gray circles. One, two, three, four, five. What I'd like for you to do is I want you to write down one thing that is of value to you or important to you in each one of those circles. So one thing that is important or of value to you. It could be a concept like freedom or justice. It could be a place like um, Bemidji or Belize. It could be a, a thing like a motorcycle or a person, like a significant other, grandchild. Um, it could be a, a thing like a motorcycle or um, jet skis. So one thing that you value or one thing that is important to you in each one of those circles. Just a little yep, yep, just the little gray circles. One, two, three, four, five gray circles. Lectures like the one you're listening to right now are the hallmark of our programs. We have um, a number of skill sets that we address. We have a number of uh, kind of problematic things in the workplace that we uh, address from micro inequities to sexual harassment to bullying in the workplace. And so these lectures become the centerpieces of the work that we do. Once we couple those with um, reflection journals with uh, final exams, uh, folks are able to, to receive a certificate uh, that is automated through their test taking to uh, reward them for all the good work that they've done. My name is Andre Cohen and I hope that you've enjoyed uh, watching this, uh, this preview, this demo class if you will, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing who you become through the work that we do together. Again, my name is Andre Cohen. Goodbye.
All right, it looks like most folks have four, if not all five. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to play a game. And the game is very simple. What I want you to do is I want you to find a minimum of two different individuals to sign on each one of the things that you wrote down that they either agree with or that they like. So I, I think that that's an, a great idea that you wrote down um, Duluth as one of the things, places that you, you value or things that you value. I think that's a good idea. So I'll put my initials next to, next to that. Hold on just before you start because I want to make sure everybody gets the same amount of time. Um, or that is similar to something that you have. Right? So it's either similar or something that you appreciate that they have on, on their paper. And uh, I'd like for you to, to get a minimum of two different people for each one of the things that you wrote down. You have five circles, which, which would mean you have a minimum of how many people? Yeah. Ten people. And it would be great if ten of those people, all ten of those people were different. All right? If, if, if you can't do that, that's fine too. But uh, let, let's shoot for that as our, as our goal. All right? Um, you have a total of 90 seconds to do this starting now. Yes, we, I, can, I do count. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, sweet friends. Thank you. Grant looking out upon the water, but you guys are everywhere. Yes. So I have family, friends, ability to do meaningful work and make a living at it, travel and health. Oh, travel. Thank you. Great, thank you. Sixty seconds. You know what? I didn't. I didn't have time to fill one out, but I will sign yours. All right. Oh, nature. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. What's going on, man? Good to see you. Yeah, good, good to, to see you. Good to see you. You're doing uh, how many at MSSA? Uh, three. The whole week. Yeah, okay. doing the doing the day. Okay. They spread mine out. I'm on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Oh, that's which, grueling. Yeah. What, what time on Friday? Uh, the last two sessions on Friday. Okay. So, which I think this, you're on Friday. Yeah, I'm doing the same. Okay. The yeah, same time. I, I so. always look through to find your name, and uh, inevitably, there's out of all of them that you do, there's always just one that I can sneak in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm glad. And I get mad because I can't get to other people's, but I may try to sneak into some earlier sessions so okay. maybe I'll try it one uh, of yours yeah, I'm, uh, first thing Wednesday morning okay and then uh, middle I think middle chunk of the day on Thursday and then uh, end of the day Friday I've got okay. uh, five months. wow what are your topics uh, harm reduction ending stigma um, creating lasting change uh, trauma 
and ethics and boundaries. Wow. So, yeah, I, I did the same thing that uh, you did a while back. Yep. I proposed five, hoping and to get they, like maybe two. And they and, took all five. Yeah, and I, <laughs> two of them then. Like I just, the trauma and uh, um, harm reduction. I've done trainings on harm reduction before, but the trauma one I figured, you know, I'm just going to, I'll throw that out. they got some ideas. Yeah. And if they pick it up, then I'll create something around it. Yeah. And then last week was like, oh, shit, I have to do trauma. <laughs> So, it's gonna be a bunch of personal stories. Now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you only have a hundred. You only have ninety minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you know. I can stutter for ninety minutes. Yeah. Four, three, two, one, and game over. Game over. So we have uh, we have a and it, it's funny to be at a so-called diversity training or or whatnot to have a diversity of people in the room um, and so if you're uh, if you're with People Incorporated if you can just raise your hand that'd be great all right cool if you're not with People Incorporated can you just tell us what organization you're with uh, City of Bloomington Human Services. oh the City of Bloomington Human Services yes Visions Incorporated Missions Incorporated in Plymouth. Yes. Um, Metro HRA. Metro, uh, Met, Metro HRA. Mm -hmm. Three of us. Northern Star Council Boy Scouts. Northern Star Council Boy Scouts. Yes. Harriet Tubman Domestic Violence Shelter. Harriet Tubman Domestic Violence Shelter and. Dakota County. CDA. Oh, D Dakota County. C CDA. CDA. Oh, CDA. Yes. Okay. Community Development. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, and who else? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, Dakota County Social Services. Sweet, 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 sweet. So uh, as many of you may or may not know, I used to, so I worked um, in Anoka County. I was their affirmative action officer for um, eight years or so. And so, um, so I have a love and an affinity for government and government work, uh, which has kind of lended itself to this idea of working with um, people who help other people because that is the the point of government and so uh so i'm glad to see my government counterparts here like Whoa! um so uh the, back to our game so as you were going around the room so so first of all was there anybody that was able to find their minimum of 10. sweet 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 um anyone able to find uh, obviously more than 10 and, and what was the, the what was your number 14, okay, yes? Yeah, like 19. 19, she's like killer networker. Anyone can have more than 19? No? What do you have in the back, ma'am? You have 12, okay. Great, 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 great. Um, so, so as you were walking around the room and you were um, reading other people's things, were there things that you saw on other people's papers and you were like, man, why didn't I think of that? I should have wrote that down. What were some of those things that you saw on other people's paper and you were like, ugh, I should have had a V8. That's, yes. Uh, nature. Nature. All right. What else? Yes. Travel. Travel. Compassion. Compassion. Integrity. Integrity. Mountain biking. Mountain biking. Literature. Literature. Acceptance. Acceptance. Sweet, 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 sweet. Were there also things that as you were going around the room that were either difficult to find someone to sign on, or you actually didn't get anyone to sign on that particular circle. Was there an example of that? Yes. Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon. Oh, so if you would have signed Portland, Oregon, had you seen it, raise your hand. If, if you, okay, great. So you have more people who value Portland, Oregon. All right. Was there something else? Yes. If you breathe, I just want to tell you, if you breathe, I'm pointing at you, right? <laughs> yes? I had heritage. I, had to, I did get signatures, but I had to keep... You had to keep going, going around. So if you're, and you meant family heritage? All right. So if your family heritage is a value to you, even if you don't know it, but if, it, if it's a value to you, please raise your hand. All right? Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> One more, one more thing that was either difficult to find someone to sign on or you didn't find someone to sign on. Yeah. 
Your cabin, right? Cabins in general, right? So if you if you value, uh, the, the, and I would imagine that cabins represent leisure, right? So so if you if you value leisure at, at some point, I mean I know you're all hardworking people, but but if you value leisure, even if you didn't write it on your paper, please raise your hand. All right, sweet, sweet, sweet. So what do you think is the um, the, the, the moral or the lesson of this particular activity. Like, why would I start out this particular session with an activity like this? To show we're more similar than we think. To show that we're more similar than we think? We have that we have similar values. Sometimes we don't articulate it the same way, but underneath we are more the same than we are different. So maybe we don't articulate it the same way, but underneath we're more the same than we are different. You guys are brilliant. <laughs> or that you don't know about those values, or you don't know about those similarities, or even those differences. You don't know about them until you engage with someone else. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe they're not the, 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 the top five. Now, what, what I would assume, I, I, I make this assumption, that uh, you did a mix of things. You, you have your highest priority things that you value, and then you have just kind of you know, random things that you value, and that if you were like me, uh, you, you may have mixed those things up and just selected five and wrote those things down. And I would imagine that you value more than five things. Would that be a safe assumption? Yeah, yeah. So out of all of those things, I think that it's very interesting that you are actually able to find connections with other human beings. If you were to do this particular activity with your clients, what do you think you would find? Similarities, same things, right? They may be identified a, a, a little bit differently, but at their core, they're, they're, they're similar. So, so I'm, really, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this because I would make the assumption that all of our parents don't know each other. Is it, would that be a safe assumption? Right? Yeah, right? That we all didn't grow up in the same communities, the same households, didn't eat cereal the same way, you know, buttered our toast differently. But how is it that we're able to come up with these things and make these connections? Because we're human, we're people. One of the things that oftentimes happens, and I, I, I've sat in chairs very much like, like this, the seats you're sitting in and heard a person present like I'm presenting, and I have found oftentimes that they, we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about our differences and not enough time talking about the ways in which we are alike. And so I, I like to balance those things today that we're both and, right? We, 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 we can be more than one thing at, at one particular time. And so... Um, that leads me to this idea of cultural humility. And cultural humility basically says that I don't know everything. And guess what? I won't know everything. But I have to be humble enough to know that I should probably ask. If there's anything you, come, you take away from you know, this idea of being culturally competent, I want you to take out the skill of being able to ask, to ask. So we're going to move on. So we'll come back to that game in just a second. Um, what is the most valuable non-renewable resource on the planet? It is, in fact, the human soul, the most valuable non-renewable resource. 
Now, uh, you know, I don't want to get into, you know, metaphysics or, you know, esoteric thinking and, and, and whatnot, but I, I do want to say that there is only one you. Ask your parents, and they're probably grateful. That there's only one you. I don't know if you can imagine me being twins. That would be like, whoa, what do we do with this one, All right? These two. Yeah, no, 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 the human soul. And so when, when, I, um, when I think about the, that, what I start to understand is that nation states are formed, kingdoms are formed to harness the power of the human soul. Of the human soul. And, you know, teaching middle school and teaching high school, I, I had to come up with some simplistic ways to talk about some pretty fancy stuff. And so if, if some of the things that I present to you seem to be... Um, simplistic, then I've done my job, right? So this idea of the human soul, and, and I take this, this particular model of the human soul, that, that the human soul is comprised of two parts. It is the, the physical body, right? It, it, it's the house that we've inherited. And it is the animating spirit that's within us. And, and whether that, you know, whatever happens to that animating spirit, once the, the body stops working, you know, you, you can find out for yourself. But, but there is clearly something that animates this that is separate from this. And, 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 and I, I give this example from the passing of my grandmother. So, so I love my grandmother, wonderful woman. Um, I misunderstood her for the majority of my life um, because I thought my grandmother was nasty. I did. I thought she was nasty. Because she would do, like, bizarre stuff. Like, we'd spend the night at her house on Saturday nights, and Sunday morning she would uh, get her jelly jar out, and there would be mold in the jelly. And my grandmother would scoop out the mold, throw it away, and then serve the jelly. Or there'd be cheese that had some mold on the cheese, and she'd just cut the, the mold off and then serve the cheese. And as a kid, I thought that was nasty <laughs> until I understood that she grew up in the Great Depression and you didn't throw away good food. And so she, she went under, uh, un, uh, misunderstood for the majority of my life. Um, but, but, but when she passed, we, we have this custom in my family. And uh, many of your families may share a similar custom where we spend um, way too much on a box that we will never use. And so uh, her box has eagle claws. inlay so you know you can look at it in different directions and see you know different you know the shimmers and all all sorts of stuff and so they stuff my grandmother in this box and uh they, they 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 put way too much makeup on my grandmother and that was not her best wig 
It was not her best wig. And so they put her in there, and they, they put her in front of this uh, the group of people, and people come by to give my grandmother their last wishes. So they come by, and they give her their last wishes. And so some people talk to my grandmother, and they, they say stuff to her. Uh, some people uh, slip my grandmother notes. And then other people, you know, you always have that one family member that wants to touch the body, right? It's like, she didn't want to touch it when she was alive. Leave her alone now, you know? So, so, you know, so we have that thing going on. But, but as people were talking to my grandmother and giving notes to my grandmother, how was my grandmother responding? She was quiet. <laughs> she was very quiet. She didn't respond. Why? Because nobody was home. So the body, without the spirit, the body becomes a thing. And later we would take a, we would uh, gather at my grandmother's house for, uh, for spaghetti dinner. And everybody would bring their version of spaghetti. I just want to tell you, you don't eat everybody's version of spaghetti, right? It's just, ugh. But we sit there and we open up the photo album and we're looking at pictures and we're laughing and we're telling jokes and I'm keeping my cousins from stealing the, the ashtrays that my grandmother hadn't used for 25 years. But, but it's still her ashtrays. You can't steal her ashtrays. And so as we're doing all this stuff and we're telling these stories and we're laughing and we're joking, it feels like my grandmother is there. But she can't animate anything. And so when the, when the human soul is, 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 is perfect, is when the body and the spirit are jointly related, that there's a good relationship. And when the spirit is separate of the body, the spirit becomes powerless. So, when the separation starts to happen, we have something that we call dis-ease. We have dis-ease. Facile means what in Spanish? Easy. Easy. When we have a separation between the body and the spirit, we have dis-ease. It's not easy. It is difficile, difficult, right? So, uh, so when we have a crack in this human soul, there are a void forms. And when the void forms, there is a monster that is waiting for this void to form. It is salivating. It is excited about this formation of the void. And do we know what that void is called? It is called free market Capitalism It's waiting for the void. What does free market capitalism say? What's the suggestion around this, 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 this void? We, we have to fill it. And not only do we have to fill it, but capitalism says what? Buy this stuff and it will fill the void. Have you ever seen a commercial that actually makes you feel better about being a human being? Most of them are telling you how your hair isn't enough of this. Or if you drink this or you take this. And I think it's really funny because you'll see some of these news programs and they create so much anxiety. And you're like, ah! And then they have an antidepressant or anti-gastro medication right after at the commercial. Right? I think that's so funny. Right? Yeah. So free market consumerism or capitalism is, is waiting for this void. But how much stuff can you buy to fill the void, to, to, to make the human soul whole again? We've had avatars that have taught us that this doesn't work. Philip Seymour Hoffman, Janis Joplin, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, Robin Williams, that hurt. That hurt. All my, all, my, all my life, I've known Robin Williams, right? Work from work, <laughs> right? Hurt. So we know that, that when we're working with our clients, part of the things that they're, they're, they're operating in is this 
disillusionment because they know that what the world tells them about what makes them healthy isn't working. And so they come to us and they say, you know, I, I've tried this, and I've tried, you know, I, I smoked this, and, and this is supposed to make me feel, feel better, but it's not working. I've slept with these number of people, and, and it's supposed to be helping me, but it's not, it's not helping me. I've tried this lifestyle or that lifestyle. I've, I've been there. I, I've moved to this place, but, but this stuff isn't working. Why? Because we're oftentimes not trying to unite the soul. And, you know, I remember uh, this came back to me as I, you know, was preparing for this and some other, other sessions. This came back to me, and it, it really um, made me think. It made me think. I was watching, uh, so when I was in elementary school, there was a, a, a mini-series on, which I think is interesting because it was three hours a night for two weeks, for 10 days, three hours a night. I don't know what a maxi-series would have been like, right? but it was a mini-series uh, based on uh, a book written by Alex Haley. And the book was, was entitled Roots, right? And so uh, in, in this opening episode, they have captured a young man um, from North Africa, uh, actually from West Africa, and um, are conditioning him for the, the economic system of slavery. They're conditioning him for this economic system of slavery. And so um, the, the young man is played by uh, LeVar Burton. And uh, if anybody's ever watched Reading Rainbow, he's the Reading Rainbow guy, you know. Take a look, it's in a book, <laughs> a Reading Rainbow. I can do anything. Okay, anybody? Okay, right. So, so he's also uh, the, the Jordy LaForge on, on Star Trek, right? So, yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so, so, and I always wondered how, wh why he would have to wear these visors if he's in the future. Like, why would he have to be blind in the future when, you know, but so late, later they took off the, the thing and he could like see like with future eyes, you know, it was just interesting, right? So, so they have, they have this young man um, conditioning him for, for the system of slavery and they have him. Tied up and, uh, and the conditioner. Um, has this just medieval, just horrible thing in his hand, and and he hits him. He and he goes, ah! and, and so the, so it, and when he hits him, he says, "What is your name?" And and Lavar Burton says, "My name is Kunta Kinte." And this conditioner says, "No, your name is Toby." Ah! Right, and so this continues on. What is your name? My name is Kunta Kinte. Right? So finally, they're on their last. They're on their last. And the conditioner hits them. And he says, What is your name? And LeVar Burton hanging there says, My name is Toby. What happened? They broke his soul. Separating his spirit from his body and now his body has become a thing. Thing. One of the things that, you know, and, and, and uh, I'm all about women's lib, and I love Wonder Woman as a character. I'm glad they're putting more clothes on her and whatnot, you know, just because all the other, but their underwear is on the outside. Anyway, so, so, so love that. Love, love, love that. Try to be an advocate in what, whatever way I can, particularly to my sisters, to, to, uh, to my mothers and my grandmothers, I, I try to be as, 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 as best of an advocate as I can. And so one of the things that, that I find interesting is that there are um, good men, men who would consider themselves to be good, who go to these things called gentlemen's clubs, right? 
And they don't go to those clubs to be gentlemen. There's nothing gentlemanly about what happens in those clubs. But they go to those clubs. And, and why do they go to, why do these men who consider themselves to be good men go to these clubs? How are they able to justify going to these clubs? Some, yeah, somebody knows somebody who's gone to one of those clubs before, right? <laughs> Because they don't know anybody there. I was one of those dudes. It was a rite of passage. I mean, it was just what dudes did. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what other guys told us, that this is the kind of stuff we're supposed to It's the stuff we saw on TV. It's stuff our friends talked about. Whether they really did it or didn't do it, we, you, know, you know, we didn't know. But, but that's what you're supposed to do. And I remember going to, to this, this place. So um, in my young adult days, I lived in St. Louis. And there, across the river from St. Louis, is a place called East St. Louis. And East St. Louis is such a depressive place that if you can afford it, you can do it. You can do it. So my best friend was coming. And um, you know, I'm still you know, evolving as a human being. I wasn't quite as human as I am today. And, um, and so we're going to celebrate by going to a strip club. Because in that strip club, they take it all off. Ooh! Right? So, so we get in there, we, we, we take our seats. And um, so, you know, we pay $7 for a Coke a piece. $7 and uh, so, so we're, we're standing there and we're just like, oh yeah, here it comes. And so the lady comes out and she's da 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 and she, she winks. And, and, and so she's doing her thing. She turns around. She's like, oh, oh, oh. And we're like, oh, dude, look at that. Oh my goodness, look at it. You know, and uh, we didn't put no money out yet. But, but we're like, oh, you know. And so I'm, I'm hitting him in the elbow. He's hitting me. We're talking. Oh, my goodness. And so, uh, so she, you know, she gets, and then she takes off her top. We're like, oh, look at that. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Right? And so, you know, we're like, and she's, and she's doing her thing. And she turns around. And then she, you know, drops her, her pants. And then she turns around. And she does her thing. And my buddy and I, we look at each other and we go, oh my goodness, what have we done? We, we're just shocked. We, we looked at each other and we're just shocked. The woman had a scar from here to here. This was somebody's mama. It was somebody's daughter, somebody's sister. We got up and we left. We've had two conversations about it since. It was the most humiliating and embarrassing thing for us. I can't imagine what it must have been like for the woman to get the courage to be able to have to to know that she has to do that in order for goofy dorks like us to give up our money so that she can feed her babies. I can't imagine what, what that must be like. But I did understand that I wasn't there to celebrate her humanity because she wasn't a human to me. She was a thing. And what, what, what do people call those things? There's a name for them. Strippers. She wasn't a human being. She was a stripper. It breaks my heart when I hear people talk about young people and they say, well, that young person was a thug. Wait a minute. You just turned a human being into a thing. So part of our job is to help re reunite this humanity, to, to give people back what they think that they've lost. And why do they think that they've lost it? Because we suffer from obstacle illusions. Obstacle illusions. Artificial barriers to authentic human relations. 
We suffer from those things. What is an obstacle illusion? Race is an obstacle illusion. The fact that, that, that my skin color may be different than yours, or my hair texture might be different, or my nose, the width of my nose might be, might be different, that is important for you to understand how other people relate to me. But that doesn't make us any different. Let's go back to your game. I'm going to ask three questions because this, this fulfills my hypothesis about how we start to reunite this human soul. And, and, and I, I just want to test this out and see if my hypothesis uh, remains to be true. So uh, please raise your hand if you can answer yes to these next three questions. Out of the five things that you wrote down as things that you value, was there anything that would be identified on a human resource form associated with your race or ethnic identity? Is there anything there that would be your race or ethnic identity on an HR form, human resource form? No. OK, cool. Um, is there anything there that, that specifically identifies your gender or gender identity? Anything specific that would identify your gender or gender identity? OK, so I have one person. All right. Lastly, for this one, I want you to jump up in the air and wave your hands like you don't care, but not you. <laughs> Is there anything that, that the IRS would indicate or could be an indication of your social economic status as determined by the IRS? No. So why is it, do you, do you think, that, that your, your racial or ethnic identity didn't show up, or for most of us, our gender or gender expression didn't show up, or lastly, our social economic status? Why did those three things not show up when I ask you to write down your values? Because they really aren't important? Why did you not write those things down? So at some extent, we take them for granted? Because core values aren't shared by everyone. It doesn't matter race, gender, economic status. So core value, there are some core values that we, that we all share, regardless of other, other things. All right, what, why else? OK, so some of it is body related and not soul. I would also suggest that you are smart for not writing those things down. And you're smart because of two things. One is that of all the things that you could value, those don't, val those don't rate as high as these other things. I'm not saying that they're not important. But they're not as important as the things that you wrote down. And secondly, I would imagine that some of you may have, been of afraid, may have been afraid to write some of those things down for what other people might say about you. And I want to you know, relieve your fear around that because people will still say whatever they want to say about you. <laughs> right? have this combination that, that we suffer from these optical illusions, that we think that we're so much different when in fact we're not, that these core values are important um, and they may show up and be demonstrated differently and may need to be responded to differently, but that's the task that we've, we've said that we're going to take. We're going to take that, we're going to take that task. We're going to wrestle with those things and we're going to help those folks in ways that make the most sense for them, right? So we're going to help heal their soul. Um, and so we, we've had institutions that said that they are going to help take responsibility for that. Um, and we'll talk about those institutions in just a second. I want to talk a little bit about schools, schools of thought um, and where we'll be kind of taking our, our, our leaning. There are, um, there's this school of, of thought around white privilege versus people of, inco uh, people of color, internalized oppression. There's this, this spectrum. There is uh, this idea of cultural competence versus cultural destructiveness, where people 
I actively work to destroy other cultures. There are monocultural mindsets and this idea of intercultural mindsets uh, where uh, monocultural is, a, is, is about simplicity and uh, intercultural mindsets are about the complexity of our relationships. Uh, there's this idea of knowledge, skills, and abilities, and the, the other end of the spectrum is this idea of sensitivity training. And so I'm gonna do my best to work through a number of these schools of thought uh, simultaneously as we move forward through, uh, through our workshop um, today. And I will also make available th this PowerPoint so uh, you don't have to feel rushed or, uh, or pressured to write down too many notes if you uh, just want to make, uh, make note of some of the things that we've talked about. And so one of the things that we, we have to offer is um, I thought that these eye devices were technological marvels. Absolutely the most magical things I've ever used. Anybody have one of these eye devices? Right? Anybody have the, the, uh, in the, the Android devices? Any of those? And, right, right. The, are those do, do you know how those things work? Like if they put, took them apart and put them all on the page and you had to put them back together and make it work, could you do, no, I couldn't do that, right? So, so as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's magic. But I have a master's degree in educational technology. So how to use technology and, 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 uh, and all this great stuff, right? And so, uh, so I have my, my eye devices at the house and I'm, you know, I'm just kind of you know, doing my stuff, working on presentations and I lay my, my, my device down. My daughter, who is 18 months, picks up my device, puts in the code, swipes, <laughs> finds Elmo, hits Elmo, and is watching, her, watching the stuff. And I'm like, this thing, I thought this thing was fancy. I have a master's degree, and I'm just learning how to work it. Here she is. She can barely talk, and she can operate my thing. And one of the things that I, I found out is through that, just watching that, is that as sophisticated as these Apple devices are or these electronic devices are, be it an Android or, or Apple device, they are designed with all of their technological advances, they're designed to be very simple. And so that got me to thinking, when we talk about these ideas of, of cultural competence and we talk about diversity stuff, We make it so complicated. It's so hard to, I don't know what to call people anymore. I don't know, you know, I don't, you know, what to, you know what's appropriate, what's inappropriate to, to, to call these people. And what I'd like to introduce you to is a concept called diversity elegance. Have you ever seen a ballet dancer do their thing? I mean, when the dudes hold up the, you know, and the, and the ladies are doing the thing. It, 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 it's very interesting to, to watch that stuff because they make it seem so simple. Have you ever tried to do it yourself? <laughs> so this idea of diversity elegance is taking these complex, these very complex ways of thinking and being, but making it user friendly for people, right? Diversity elegance. And so what I'd like for you to think about is, how do you take these concepts that we're using and make them elegant? How do you make them user-friendly for folks? White privilege, the concept of white privilege, is, is a great concept. It's a sound concept. It is not user-friendly. How do you tell a kid from Frogtown, a white kid from Frogtown, who has been oppressed just like his Latino, Hmong, and black brothers and sisters that he's got privilege that they don't. And it, it may very well exist, but we have to have a more critical conversation. We have to have some elegance in how do we bring those folks along. One of the things that I, 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 I can see now is that for the last 16 years that President Barack um, Hussein Obama has been president, there's been a large group of folks who have felt that they have not had a voice. And now they seem to feel like they have a voice. And how do we get those brothers and sisters back? How do we bring them back into the fold and say this is what's best for all of us? Um, 
So this idea of cultural humility or, uh, or diversity elegance basically is one that is, uh, constructs the understanding of developing a process-oriented approach to competency. Um, it is conceptualized cultural humility as the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other-oriented and open to others uh, in relation to aspects of cultural identity that are most important to the observer, right, so to the person. So being able, this idea of cultural humility, this diversity elegance is really about being able to op be open to other ways of being and not being threatened by other ways of being, right? Boop, 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 boop. So one of the things that we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about in, in, um, is the Bennett model of cultural development and moving from monocultural mindsets to intercultural mindsets and this idea of denial, polarization, minimization, acceptance, and adaptation. And what we, and I'll talk about this too, this, this idea of Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, it, it actually moves along this continuum and we can see where some conflict happens when we move along this, this, this continuum. Um, in the Bennett model, the monocultural mindset misses differences. It's a denial. The differences aren't important. Let's not talk about differences. Um, polarization starts to talk about, you know, one difference is better than another difference. Um, this idea of minimization de-emphasizes de, um, de differences and say, you know, says people are people, you know, no matter what color, I don't see color, I'm colorblind, therefore um, I'm a good person. Um, acceptance is this idea that I understand differences, so I know what day Cinco de Mayo is on. <laughs> uh, where adaptation says, uh, I know how to cross bridges. I know how to work with folks across cultural uh, boundaries. Um, I know when to uh, assimilate, when to imitate, when to um, be adaptive to, to those environments. So we'll, we'll talk about that um, more a little later. Okay, so we'll do this one last piece and then we'll, um, we'll take a break. So no, 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 let's take the break now. We'll take the break now and we'll come back with this. Um, you've been sitting long enough. I appreciate your, your time. Thank you so much. I'm making a beeline for the bathroom.